Thanks very much, Sarah. And uh, yeah, thank you for everyone uh, for joining the talk today. Um, so as you can see on the screen, I'm going to speak about the topic of state-state mining partnerships, um, which is a relatively new tool, innovation, um, new thing, I guess you could say, on, on the scene. And it might be something that a few of you have been thinking about. Um, to be frank, it's it's a topic where there's probably more questions than answers still, including for me. So hoping that this could be um, quite an, an open discussion with everyone today. Um, so first, I'm going to start by introducing the organisation that I work for and the work we do um, and just share a little bit about the angle that we're coming at when we're talking about these partnerships. Um, then we'll go into a little bit about what we know, what we don't know about them, um, and then open up some space uh, for discussion as well. So to first introduce the Natural Resource Governance Institute, NRGI, for those that don't know us, um, we're a research and advocacy NGO that focuses on supporting um, informed and inclusive decision making about natural resources with an overall goal to advance um, a just energy transition. And so as the name suggests, we're focused on, on governance in particular, which we think is really essential for achieving that goal. Um, our focus is on the experience of lower and middle income um, resource rich countries. So we've got 12 priority countries that we focus on across Latin America, Africa and Asia Pacific. Um, and with the majority of, of uh, my colleagues are based based in and from those countries. Um, I'm actually based in London, which I realise I forgot to say in my, my introduction earlier. Um, and so much of our work is focused on the policy processes within those countries, um, but we also strive to ensure that their needs and their experiences are better understood and reflected in global policy debates um, and in the policy processes of major markets. And so this is the kind of perspective um, that we're coming from and why we've been interested in these these state state mining partnerships that are are popping up. And so to get into it, uh, there we go. Next slide. Um, what are these state-state mining partnerships? It was kind of, I guess, to some extent, the golden question. It means strategic partnerships, mineral security partnerships, memoranda of, co memoranda of cooperation or of understanding, various kind of names floating about for, for these. And we've settled on calling them state-state mining partnerships to just make it a bit easier to, to understand and to categorize them. Ultimately, what they boil down to is a form of agreement between two different states on this topic of mining um, about exploration processing these different different elements of the supply chain. They tend to arise between wealthier jurisdictions such as the EU and the US um, that are aiming to secure the minerals that they need for renew renewable technologies and we'll call them buying partners in this presentation. Um, and then those agreements are made with uh, mineral rich countries who were referred to as supplying partners. To be honest, they seem to be largely driven by political or geostrategic geo needs of the, the buying partners and um, who are keen to diversify supply and think we're all familiar with the geopolitical discussions that are going on right now, concerns about the role of China and the role of other countries and, and, and markets in this space. Um, and I think that's what's led to this sort of flurry of new policy processes that we're seeing um, in Washington and Brussels and elsewhere. Um, so these partnerships may lay the groundwork for future cooperation between different jurisdictions. They might incentivize buyer country industries to, to invest in a particular supplier country um, and or they might frankly just send a, a warning shot to international competitors, for lack of a better term, that the buying partner has an interest um, in this country um, and sourcing minerals from them. So a crucial point to note is that the documents we've seen are not legally binding. Um, and that the relationship between these partnerships and existing trade agreements isn't particularly clear. So I think that's what makes them a little bit of an unusual animal to understand what their role is in this space. And um, similarly, the extent to which the agreements align with supplying partners mining or industrial policy frameworks is also largely unknown. So while some of the frameworks for these partnerships are set out in legislation, such as the EU's critical raw materials regulation, the process for others and, and the content as well remains a mystery. So, for example, it's been very difficult to find any information about four partnerships that were signed, signed by Saudi Arabia with Egypt, Morocco, DRC and Russia um, at the Future Minerals Forum in Riyadh in January this year. But for us, I think the more interesting question, the harder one to answer is, what are the supplying partners getting out of these deals? There's a lot of language about partnership and about win-win approaches, but it remains to be seen whether these partnerships will actually deliver on this promise. 
And part of the reason for that is that there's just a real lack of publicly available information about what is actually going on, what these partnerships entail. Um, so 22 of the 35 um, partnerships that we identified um, by early February this year had no publicly information, publicly available information, which means that scrutinizing them is very difficult. This creates a significant accountability gap where it becomes very hard for countries, citizens and impacted communities, as well as businesses and other people involved in this ecosystem to know exactly what the partnerships mean. So we're trying to, in a very small way, address that at NRGI uh, because we see transparency as foundational, um, although insufficient alone for better governance in the extractive sector, because how can you improve what you don't know? Um, and so for over a decade, we've worked to increase transparency and facilitate understanding of contracts and deals in this space. So first launched in 2012, uh, one of the ways we've tried to do this is through our resource contracts website. Um, which is a free to access uh, repository of over 3000 contracts um, and associated documents in the petroleum and mining sectors covering um, 105 countries so far. So a key goal of this is to make publicly available contracts more accessible by explaining key terms and enabling searches for specific clauses on specific topics um, or to help people to compare contracts in certain commodity markets or by company all of these different things, all of the purpose of which is to make it easier for interested parties to understand if they're getting a fair deal or not and to hold governments and companies to account in that. Um, so although this, this, um, this tool has traditionally been used for contracts between companies and states, earlier this year, we adapted the framework to allow us to upload uh, memorandums of understanding, MOUs or other relevant document, uh, documentation signed as part of these partnerships. Um, so as I said, there isn't actually all that much that we can upload yet. So this is a kind of first step that we're hoping to build on um, throughout the year and beyond as we, we hopefully see more information coming out about these partnerships and what they entail. Um, so early early days, but nonetheless, we hope that this research uh, this resource will be a useful, a useful tool for researchers, for journalists, for CSOs, companies, governments, officials, anyone who's keen to understand a little bit more about these partnerships and compare and contrast their content. So... Um, if you go to the website, I can share the links to, to this afterwards, of course. And if you hit the search bar, if you go into contract type um, and go to transition mineral agreement, um, that's the way that you can you can find these listed. Um, I should also say that um, the last time we did an upload for this was at the start of February, and this is a very kind of fast moving environment. So there's definitely ones that we know that we need to upload, for example, EU ones with um, Norway, Uzbekistan, Rwanda. Um, and also, this is an open invitation that if there's ones that are missing, please do feel free to, to reach out to us and, and we'll do our best to upload them if we can, if there's enough information that we can go on. So to share a little bit about what we've seen so far, um, across the published documents, we see that parties typically use similar language to describe the potential benefits for supplying partners. Many documents uh, refer to, to technology transfer, to value addition, to ESG the familiar kind of buzzwords that you hear in this space. But unfortunately, there is very little in terms of specifics of what is meant by this um, and very little on next steps um, beyond, beyond what's in the memorandum so far. You also tend to see similar language being used across um, different, different agreements, which suggests there's a bit of a, a one size fits all approach sometimes being taken by the the buying partners rather than thinking specifically about what different countries, which di what different mineral producing countries might need. Um, it does seem though that the signing of these partnerships and agreements should be seen as a first step rather than a complete solution. So for example, the EU commits to developing a roadmap six months after they've signed an MOU, um, although it's fair to say that they haven't always met this commitment, <laughs> or at least they're not publishing them within these time frame, but I have to say, I mean, I was at the EU Raw Materials Week in November and this issue was raised several times by CSOs and I'm yet to see much more appear on the website. So I can see Ludovine also shaking her head. If there's anyone who's listening that has the, the key to where you can find this information, please, please do let us know. Um, and so, yeah, ultimately what we can tell is that from for most partnerships, they will rely on their ability to attract commercial investment from the buying partner or, or its allies. And the main lever will be to, um, to have preferential financial and development assistance to create more attractive conditions for investment. But as I say, still very difficult to know exactly 
how these partnerships will work in practice. But that doesn't mean that we can just have to sit back. We can also be a bit more proactive, put forward some suggestions of what we would like to see from these partnerships. So I think one of the first things that is um, important, particularly from the perspective of the countries that we're working with, um, is to make sure that mineral rich countries are coming um, ready to leverage this interest from countries and coming with a coherent approach um, to jurisdictions like the US, EU, Japan, UK, whoever it is, um, to think about how that they can use this interest to pursue their long term strategy for the sector um, and for economic development more broadly. So um, they should target the buying partners political, financial, te uh, technical capacity um, in a way that might be less feasible in partnerships with individual commercial investors. So this could be things like technical assistance on geological data management, financing um, around energy bottlenecks that make it harder um, to, to, to uh, lock in commercial investment for, for processing plants, for industrialization, for other things that would be helpful for a country's development. Um, to gain access to, to incentives that are offered in buying partners markets. So, for example, the kind of things that we've seen through the US Inflation Reduction Act. Um, secondly, from all partners, we want to see better coordination and clarity on how these partnerships interact. So in some cases, we've seen uh, partners come together jointly. So the US, the UK and the EU um, on their support for the Lobito Corridor, um, which is a route to transport um, materials from the DRC in Zambia to Angola's Atlantic coast and to markets beyond for anyone that's that's not familiar with it. Um, but in other cases, it's, it's less clear if and how different jurisdictions are working together. And even within jurisdictions, it's not really clear what the strategy is. Um, for example, the EU's decision to, to pursue a strategic partnership with, with Rwanda has unsurprisingly led to significant backlash within DRC, who they have also agreed a partnership with. And I think that's something that anyone with even a watching uh, diplomatic eye on the region could have predicted. Um, so thirdly, um, I think um, it's also important, and um, this is something that I think you will hear from a lot of civil society actors, for these partnerships to, to consider and, and demonstrate support for higher um, governance, human rights and environmental standards and to, to, for a bit more clarity about how they are being built into, into the partnerships themselves. So it's no secret that the mining industry has a pretty poor track record when it comes to things like pollution, to human rights, to, to corruption, unfortunately. Um, so it needs to be clear what how these partnerships are thinking about those issues, how they're being cognizant of those risks and what they're doing to, to help address them. So, for example, there could be um, stronger due diligence practices built into these processes. There could be more capacity building and technical assistance um, for countries where mining is taking place when it comes to social environmental protections. Um, and of course, high income countries where companies are based could do more to hold, to hold those companies to account for wrongdoing. Um, and then lastly, I think we want to see um, all partners do more to, facilita to facilitate the input of civil society actors and, and other relevant stakeholders like, like trade unions or community groups into these negotiations. So CSOs can serve both as a source of expertise and as an accountability mechanism um, to ensure that the supplying partner um, gets the most out of the partnership. They can help define strategic priorities. They can play a key role in monitoring whether projects meet international standards and they can strengthen calls for uh, partnerships to be more equitable. Um, but their participation has been lacking so far. And to be frank, if these partnerships do remain political tools, then civil society might in fact find that their, their time is better spent elsewhere. So at this point, many questions remain, a lot left to be seen, but it does seem like it's an important thing for, for those of us that work in the sector to be keeping an eye on and understanding how they influence all of our work, which will be from a different perspective, of course. Um, so yeah, I'll finish up there. I've just left some questions that I have, to be honest, for, for everyone that's participating as well of, do you see these partnerships as, as a useful addition to the mining landscape? Have you interacted with governments on these partnerships? And if so, what has been your experience? I think this is a bit of a, a learning process for everyone. So I'm, I'm interested to know what others are thinking of this topic as we kind of navigate this new, this new tool. So yeah, thank you.
Susanna, thank you so, so much for that. Absolutely brilliant. Everyone, round of applause for the fabulous Susanna Fitzgerald. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm loving the fact that you've posed questions to us there. So that that means, makes the next five minutes very easy for me. But unfortunately, or well, fortunately, we've received a huge number of questions actually in the chat, both here in Zoom, but also in YouTube. Um, so let's go through some of them. But um, Everyone who is dialed in and listening, if you'd like to address Susanna's questions, we'll also put them into the chat for you as well so you can remember what they were. Please feel free to engage with that and we can carry on talking in the chat whilst we listen to our next few talks. So, Susanna, the first question that came in was actually on YouTube. Um, and this question asks, how can developing countries with limited expertise in mining, like, say, Malawi, fully benefit from state to state mining partnerships without being exploited? What do you think? I mean, I think this is actually the, the key question, and it's not just for countries that maybe have less experience. I think it's also for countries that, that have experience already. And it, and it touches on the kind of the key issue in talking about mining and talking about a just energy transition is that there is a power dynamic that goes on and there is kind of unequal relations here. So um, I think for countries that don't have a lot of expertise themselves already. I think that's where it's important to, to rely on peers, to rely on the expertise of, of those in, in academia, in civil society, and um, researchers as much as possible. And I think many of us are, are happy to help where we can. Um, and I think also learning from the experiences of, of other countries. I think this is why we wanted to upload everything to resource contracts so that you can see what's being put in agreements, the kind of things that you should expect, the kind of things where you could maybe push for and ask for something something more. But I do think it's also, there's a responsibility here for the the, the countries or the, the jurisdictions, it might be a block like the, the, the EU that are making these partnership deals themselves to, to do better, to, to recognize that there has been um, an unacceptable level of inequality of exploitation that's gone on in this sector in the past and to be proactive in offering things that could help um, a country so taking Malawi as, the, as the, the the question set out that you know what what does Malawi need it's not a country that I know a lot about in depth but if they've got concerns about for example the environmental impact of mining or they need help maybe um, setting up a cadaster or like you know some of the more technical elements of that what can these and supplying partners do to support that as well. And I think they're the kind of things that people in policymakers should be thinking about as well in terms of what is their offer? What, what are they bringing to the table? Because there's a lot of geopolitics going on just now and there's a lot of people competing for minerals and in some ways it can feel quite uncomfortable, I think. So yeah, I think trying to think about those things, I, that's a quite meandering answer, but. I think that's what that's what I would say. No, it's it it's great because I think as you as you um said during your talk, there are a huge number of these um, agreements or MOUs etc. being signed, and I think anyone who's been to one of the big international conferences recently, there's always some big announcement that is made between two different um, states or jurisdictions or whatever. And um, I don't know, I confess that my reaction is usually just a slightly raised eyebrow and thinking, OK, well, let's see what comes of that then, because <laughs> uh, we haven't necessarily seen much action out of some of the others. But um, just to quickly dive back into the questions that are in the chat. So question from Murray, who asks, how much pushback are you getting when you ask for specific agreements? Um, do you see difference between private industry and governments? And is there any push to get banks involved in transaction to provide the underlying agreements? What do you think? Um, in terms of pushback, um, it sort of depends. I mean, like more broadly than just these partnerships, pushing for contract transparency has been a big part of NRGI's work. And a lot of the contracts that we have on resource contracts are because of advocacy that we've done within countries to support contract transparency as being uh, being a stronger norm. Um, I would say there's, I slightly have the sense, and maybe the EU is the best example for this uh, question, because they actually have a framework set out in which they should be publishing stuff. I get the sense that it's not necessarily malicious lack of public publication I think it's just stuff is really off track and it's really behind schedules and they're also trying to a little bit 
work out what they're doing as they they go and I mean that's just very much a, a personal opinion there might be others who who've had a different experience um I don't think I have too much to say on on the other questions but something that I've heard in terms of kind of like the broader financial elements is that um the IFC's performance standards will be key for this kind of due diligence uh, dynamic so a lot of questions still to be asked and I think to be fair to policymakers they also have these questions and they're I think they're open to thoughts on how to improve things so yeah again not sure if I quite answered the the questions there but I'll, I'll maybe leave it at that conscious of time. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Susanna. I think we could carry on asking you questions for a long time. And in return, we will, of course, answer your questions too. So with that, everyone, please put your hands together for Susanna. Thank you very, very much.